Well, welcome. Welcome, everybody, friends, supporters, alumni, colleagues, to the third Woodson Lecture and, importantly, the annual Australian Institute of Building Address. Um, we are very proud of our association with the AI AIB, uh, delighted that they support our faculty in such a, an extraordinary way, and, of course, through them, we have a special welcome to our, our speaker tonight, uh, the Honourable Sir Anthony Mason, and we also welcome Lady Patricia Mason. We thank them both for coming and for everybody coming on what is, in fact, quite a difficult, damp, congested night. And uh, there are some people we know who rang and said they couldn't come and, and so on. But it's, a, it's, it's very close to a full house. Uh, a little bit about the Utzon series. It's, it's, uh, it's been very successful. It's been growing um, in, in, its, um, in the way it's been handled by us. And we've had, over the years, extraordinary speakers. And for those of you who have had, had come to the last few, um, you might, might reflect on, I, I think, excellent addresses by our own Professor Michael Newman um, in sustainable urbanism. And, and uh, more recently, uh, Hiroshi Sambuichi, who is one of us, uh, Japan's leading uh, architects. And, and uh, tonight is, is going to be in that league, if not better. It's an exceptional uh, lecture that we look forward to. But it's a lecture in a way that uh, balances what we've seen in the past. In, in our faculty, we, 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 we say we, are, we, we strive for and we are, in many respects, knowledge leaders in the design, delivery, and management of the 21st century city and all, all the elements within it. And we, we pride ourselves in, in, re in recognizing and demonstrating the uh, importance of mutual respect and dependency of the disciplines that will deliver a better, a better world, a more sustainable world, a, a world with lower carbon outputs and all the things that are really facing us today and the challenges of tomorrow. And our university stresses the links with industry and the relevance of our research to, to the societies we serve, our contemporary society. And we are really interested as a university in science, technology, and professions, and particularly in our case, the exchange of information between the professions. So in our audience tonight are, of course, many, many people in the, in the construction industry, but I also can see many faces from the various design industries, and we think that's very important. Um, so our faculty is really proud to be associated, as I mentioned, with the AIB and to continue uh, the constructive dialogue and, and the progressive dialogue, if you like, about how we can, uh, our graduate profiles, how we can work better together, uh, how we can shape the future of Australia through the knowledge exchange that comes from, from these sorts of activities and from our faculty, and also how to develop discipline excellence within the construction management and property industry. So our, our association with the AOB um, is because they strive to improve and protect the building profession, and where we would say that we support that from the knowledge and from the graduates that we deliver to it. Um, now some context for tonight's AIB lecture. Um, we, we, we go back a few years, and for example, recent speakers have included Sir Lawrence Street, Colonel Ian Cummings, Lieutenant General Ken Gillespie, uh, the Honourable Terence Cole, um, Professor Murray Coleman, and most recently, uh, Dr. Harry Triggerboff. And so tonight's speaker, Sir Anthony Mason, is in reasonable company, we think, and the great lecture series for us. Now, before I introduce um, uh, Sir Anthony, I'm pleased to introduce Robert Whittaker, the National Vice President of the Australian Institute of Building and a very good friend of the faculty. And with, with Bob, we've together worked hard to not only uh, work through our, our disciplines together with industry interests, but also for this lecture series. So I welcome Bob to, to the stage to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance. It's uh, quite staggering to look at a full house <laughs> on this occasion, on this wet and windy night. I'll keep it brief because you want to hear the man of the moment, which is Sir Anthony. But to put it into context, the Australian Institute of Building is the outfit which accredits your construction management degree here at the Uni of New South Wales and also its master's degree. It's because of our accreditation that your course, your qualifications, will fulfil the educational criteria for a builder's licence in every jurisdiction in the country. 
It also fulfills the educational criteria to become a building certifier. And in that one state, we're quantity surveyors regulated ditto. Now, we've been heavily involved with this degree since its inception, uh, close to 50 years ago. I'll make the point that our application forms, this is to the students, are just over there, and I encourage you to get onto our website if you wish to have some more or get in contact with myself directly. But we are a membership organisation. I'd like to thank the support of the Master Builders Association uh, and their continued support of the AIB. We are an outfit accredited or incorporated by Royal Charter. We, we receive that in the same year as the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Humanities. And inevitably, on evenings such as this, we get asked what's the difference. Well, businesses and organisations join the MBA and individuals join us. So, Murray Coleman, the former global CEO of Bovis Lend Lease, is a member of us. Peter Hansen, the owner of Hansen Yunkin, is a member of us. And on it goes, and all their firms are members of the MBA. But we need your support, we need your ongoing dialogue. Our work doesn't end. Uh, in the last 12 months alone, we've affirmed, we've had our copyright affirmed over the titles of not just Chartered Builder, but Chartered Quantity Surveyor and Chartered Building Surveyor, which is some of the career paths which some of you might be considering tonight. Help us continue the good work. We'd like to have you on board. Now, that's about where I'll leave it, but it can't, the evening cannot pass without our thanks, not just to Alex, but also to Catherine Brown and to the academic staff here at the Uni in New South Wales. And in particular, and please forgive me if I miss anyone here, Michael Brand, Martin Loosemall, Brenton Lim, Sid Newton, uh, Imira, whose surname I always forget, so forgive me, okay, Jimmy Kim, and John Cohen. Okay, if I've missed anyone, please forgive me, but I'd like you to consider, the, all of you here, consider the hard work that those and other individuals, and I'm should also member, member uh, Dr. John Willett as well, in making this degree and these degree programs possible. Right? It is a people business that we are in and um, we commend you uh, their efforts over not just this year but over a long, long period of time. I think I've dilly-dallied enough. I'll hand you over back to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sir Anthony Mason. And uh, as you may all know, he has a long association with the University of New South Wales and is a former chancellor. And, and today, there are still many connections. For example, Sir Anthony's um, uh, name is uh, connected with the law school. Um, our current professor, George Williams, holds the Sir Anthony, Sir Anthony Mason Chair in Public Law, named after Sir Anthony and sponsored by the law firm Gilbert and Tobin, and Professor Andrew Lynch is the current director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law, again uh, associated with Sir Anthony. Um, a few things about Sir Anthony. I mean, many of you know him from lots of many years over a long time and tremendous contribution to Australia. He was Justice of the High Court of Australia from 1972 to 1987 and Chief Justice from 1987 to 1995. He was Commonwealth Solicitor General from 1964 to 1969 and a judge of the New South Wales Court of Appeal from 1969 to 1972. Apart from his work as Chancellor of the University of New South Wales, he was National Fellow at the Research School of Social Sciences at the ANU, a judge of the Supreme Court of Fiji and President of the Solomon Islands Court of Appeal. In 19 1996 1997, he was Arthur Goodhart Professor in Legal Science at Cambridge University. And since 2001, he has been Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the ANU College of Law. And he's been appointed as a non permanent judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal since 1997 and holds honorary doctorates from the Australian National University, Sydney, Melbourne, Monash, Griffith, Deakin Universities, UNIS. W and Universities of Oxford and Hong Kong. Please welcome Sir Anthony Mason. <laughs> Professor Zanis, uh, Mr Whittaker, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to give the 2012 AIB annual address as part of the Built Environments Woodson Lectures. 
and all the more so as I appeared as counsel for the New South Wales Government in the arbitration between the construction arm of Lend-Lease Corporation, the builders of the Opera House, uh, and the government, uh, an arbitration over the construction of what I think was termed stage one of the contract. Now, the subject of this lecture is a significant legal aspect of contract administration. While contract administration can scarcely be described as a feel-good or lifestyle element in the construction industry, um, its importance cannot be denied. One suspects that a number of the recent misfortunes that have overtaken companies in the Australian construction industry are due to uh, a lack of attention given to contract administration. And I suspect that that suspicion is very well founded. And in the last week, newspapers have reported that union members have engaged in a go slow campaign on the construction of the airport, airport link highway in Queensland linking the city of Brisbane and the airport. And they have engaged in that go slow campaign in support of a campaign for the payment of higher wages. The point of the go slow campaign is that it could expose the contractor to a significant liability under an agreed damages clause in the highway construction contract if the contractor does not complete on time. Because most construction contracts require the contractor to complete the works by a fixed date, an agreed damages clause in a contract has an obvious importance. The parties will endeavour to agree on a completion date at an early stage of their negotiations. The contractor will be expected to submit for approval a program of works showing how the works will progress up to the completion date. If the contract does not fix a date for completion, the time for completion is at large. By contract and by common law, the contractor is then under a duty to complete the works within a reasonable time. What is a reasonable time is a question of fact to be determined in the light of all the relevant circumstances of the case. This is not a very helpful test and it gives rise to considerable uncertainty. This uncertainty makes it all the more desirable for the parties to fix a time for completion in their contract. As an aside, I should say to you that when I, in my youth, decided to take up law as a study, I was attracted to it by the thought that the law was really a certain discipline. My experience in the law for the whole of my career has convinced me it is an entirely uncertain discipline. Indeed, some unkind people have been uh, unkind enough to say that I have contributed throughout my career to the uncertainty of the law. An agreed da damages clause is usually associated with a time fixed by the contract for completion. It operates when the contractor is in breach of his obligation to complete by the date fixed. The contract usually sets out the procedure to be followed in the case of such a breach and it may make compliance with that procedure a condition precedent of the entitlement of the owner to recover under the agreed damages clause for the breach. Liquidated damages clause, another name for an agreed damages cl clause, are a common feature of construction contracts, shipbuilding, hire purchase, chattel lease, and many other forms of contract. In essence, they provide for the payment by one party to the other of a sum certain or ascertainable by the party in breach of contract to the other party by way of agreed damage for that breach. Uh, and I'll give you an example of an agreed 
damages clause. Um, this is taken from an English form of construction contract used in Hong Kong. If the works under construction do not reach practical completion by the date for practical completion, the superintendent shall certify as due and payable to the principal liquidated damages in an item specified for every day after the date for practical completion to and including the earliest of the date of practical completion or termination of the contract or the principal taking the works under construction out of the hands of the contractor. If an extension of time is directed after the contractor has paid or the principal has set off liquidated damages, the principal shall forthwith repay to the contractor such of those damages as represent the days the subject of the extension of time. And an annexure to the contract will leave space for the parties to insert a rate or an amount of liquidated damages to be paid. The function of an agreed damages clause is to overcome the requirement of proof of loss in a claim for damages. In many cases, the proof of loss, for example, where there is delay in the construction of manufacturing or commercial premises and the delay has resulted in substantial loss of profits, the proof of that loss is a very difficult and time-consuming exercise, often requiring the calling of expert witnesses and resulting in a conflict of evidence given by expert witnesses. The fixing of the liquidated damages in an ascertainable amount or an amount capable of being ascertained by reference to the provisions of the contract as in the example I've just given, avoids the necessity of proof of loss. Reco recovery of compensation is thereby facilitated. In effect, the agreed damages are an admitted pre-assessment of damages. An agreed damages clause therefore provides some certainty as to the quantum of damages and simplifies the resolution of the dispute in that respect. The two characteristics of a liquidated sum are one, it is fixed by the contract and two, it is due for payment by the defendant. If these two characteristics are satisfied, the sum may be recovered as a debt. Not all agreed damages clauses are enforceable. Such a clause is unenforceable if it amounts to a penalty, that is, a penalty for breach of contract. If the amount agreed upon is not a genuine pre-estimate of loss of damage, that is a realistic assessment of loss of damage, but is simply stipu stipulated as interorum of the defendant, that is, as a deterrent for breach of contract, it will be held to be a penalty and unenforceable. In that event, the injured party is relegated to claim the damages which it would have been entitled to at common law for the breach of contract committed. In other words, it then has to commence an action for breach of contract and prove the loss and damage that it has actually suffered before it can recover. Two questions arise in relation to a particular agreed damages clause. First, having regard to the nature of the clause and the circumstances in which it arises, is the clause one to which this distinction between liquidated damages and penalty applies? Two, assuming the distinction applies, is the clause to be classified as a valid and enforceable liquidated damages provision or as an invalid and unenforceable penalty. The Dunlop case, which formulated this distinction in 1915, 
has had a continuing influence ever since. It was a decision of the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, the United Kingdom's highest court, known simply to lawyers throughout the world as the House of Lords, but of course a body, though part of, uh, in terms it is distinct from the House of Lords as a legislative body. Um, in those days, the judges who were members of the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords uh, also sat in the Privy Council, uh, the body which heard opinions, appeals from the Dominions and colonial courts, including Australian courts. Privy Council decisions were binding on Australian courts and by and large, because the judges were the same, decisions of the House of Lords were almost in practice binding on Australian courts. So a judgment of the House of Lords in 1915 was regarded in practice as deciding the common law of Australia, at least at that time. Um, in that case, the appellants, who were manufacturers of motor tyres, covers and tubes, supplied them to dealers under an agreement whereby the respondents, in consideration of trade discounts, bound themselves not to sell or offer the goods to any private customers or to any cooperative at less than the appellant's current list prices and to pay a stipulated sum by way of liquidated damages for every tyre, cover or tube sold or offered in breach of the agreement. The respondent sold a tyre cover to a cooperative society below the current list price. In an action for breach of contract, it was proved that substantially the whole of the appellant's business in these articles was done through the trade, that to prevent the underselling, the appellants insisted upon all their trade customers signing agreements of this nature, and that the probable effect of underselling by any particular trade customer was to force their other trade customers to deal elsewhere. The House of Lords held, assuming without deciding, that the stipulated sum applied to all the preceding stipulations in the agreement that, was that it was liquidated damages. A Scottish judge, Lord Dunedin, delivered the principal, government, uh, the principal judgment. Now, Lord Dunedin was a well-known judge but he's chiefly remembered these days because the Lord Chancellor at the time described him as a judge who invariably snored throughout the hearing of all appeals before the House of Lords. Indeed, the Lord Chancellor said, uh, we would have asked him to stop snoring, but for the fact that that might have disturbed the other members of the House of Lords from their slumbers. <laughs> now, Lord Dunedin said, the question whether a sum um, is either liquidated damages or a penalty is a question of construction to be decided upon the terms and the circumstances of each particular contract, judged as at the time of the making of the contract, not at the time of breach. Just why it is a question of a construction and not a matter of evidence uh, is something I've never been able to understand and I don't propose tonight to try and justify what Lord Dunedin said. More often than not, a sum is held to be a penalty because it is out of all proportion to the loss likely to be suffered. And the sum stipulated may be recoverable even if no loss is actually suffered so long as the amount stipulated is not out of all proportion to what might happen. Lord Dunedin went on to state these tests among others. A, it will be a penalty if the sum stipulated is extravagant and unconscionable in amount in comparison with the greatest loss that could conceivably be proved to have followed from the breach. B, it will be a penalty if the breach consists only in not paying a sum of money 
and the sum stipulated is greater than the sum which ought to have been paid. Now, I think that's too broad a statement these days, and my reason for saying that will appear shortly. There will be a presumption that it is a penalty when a single sum is made payable by way of compensation on the occurrence of one or more or all of several events, some of which may occasion serious and others but trifling damage. And D, it is no obstacle to the sum stipulated being a genuine pre-estimate of damage that the consequences of the breach are such as to make precise pre-estimation almost an impossibility. This is just the sort of case where liquidated damages are appropriate. In 2005, the High Court of Australia, in a case known as Ringro and BP Australia, approved the Dunlop approach, but went on to say that it would leave any substantial reconsideration of the Dunlop tests, which I've stated to you, to a case in which they were an issue, and concluded that the payment stipulated for will be a penalty if it is out of all proportion to the damage that may arise, the very expression that I mentioned a few moments ago. And in Ringro, the court went on to emphasise the importance of freedom of contract. Now, the importance of that concept, freedom of contract, uh, is becoming uh, increasingly recognised in the cases, particularly in England, but also in Australia. And I'll indicate shortly what impact that is having on the law of liquidated damages and penalty. Although Lord Dunedin considered that when the liquidated sum is challenged as a penalty, the onus is on the party seeking to establish that it is a genuine pre-estimate of damages. The modern English authorities assert that the onus lies with the person seeking to establish that the provision is a penalty. That is, the onus lies on the person seeking to establish that the provision is invalid or unenforceable. Thus, Lord Wolfe, in a Hong Kong case, Phillips Hong Kong and the Attorney General of Hong Kong, said that the court has to be careful not to set too stringent a standard and bear in mind that what the parties have agreed should normally be held as upheld as any other approach would lead to undesirable uncertainty in a commercial contract. Um, I was going to add a reference to a judgment of another English judge, Lord Clark, of stone come ebony, but uh, I decided what he said wasn't worthwhile, but I must say his name is certainly worthy of mention. Um, now, it appears on my inquiries that at some time in medieval England, two villages, one rejoicing in the name of stone and the other rejoicing in the name of ebony, uh, decided that they would become one village. So they decided to adopt this name, Stone Come Ebony. Come, of course, being the Latin word for with. Now, um, one of the things that's always intrigued me about the United Kingdom is that people who are elevated to the House of Lords uh, have the option of adding to their name uh, a reference to their place of birth. So Stone Come Ebony was obviously Lord Clark's place, place of birth. And uh, a good friend of mine, who was president of the Court of New Zealand, Appeal Court, Court of Appeal of New Zealand, Sir Robin Cook was elevated uh, to the House of Lords and sat as a judge in the House of Lords. And when he did so, he adopted the name Lord Cook of Thorndon, Thorndon being a somewhat obscure suburb of Wellington in New Zealand. Um, he was a colleague of mine on the Supreme Court of Fiji. And uh, at one stage, I noticed after he'd been elevated to the House of Lords, 
instead of signing the judgments Robin Cook, he actually signed the judgments Cook of Thorndon. And I then said to a colleague of mine who succeeded me as Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, uh, Sir Gerard Brennan, who was sitting with us, should I sign the judgment Mason of Mossman? <laughs> Mossman being my, not the suburb of my birth, but the suburb where I resided. And he said to me, no, I wouldn't if I were you. They'll think you're a second-hand car dealer. <laughs> um, but to come back to what Lord Wolfe said, um, uh, giving the, recognising the importance of freedom of contract and the desirability of upholding what the parties have agreed to in their contract is important in cases where the parties are of equal bargaining power. And in such cases, the court will be circumspect before it strikes down such a provision. Nonetheless, it's got to be a genuine pre-estimate of damage, though it must be said the English cases, the recent English cases, focus on the question whether it was a deterrent. The problem with the criterion genuine pre-estimate of damage or deterrent is that any clause which provides for the payment of a substantial sum of money upon breach is likely to deter a breach even if it is a genuine attempt to estimate the potential damage which might arise from breach. That is why an English judge, Justice Coleman, said in a case called Lord's Vale Finance and the Bank of Zambia that the question is whether at the time of contract the contract was entered into the predominant contractual function was to deter a party from breaking the contract or to compensate the innocent party for breach. That the contractual function is deterrent rather than compensatory can be deduced by comparing the amount that would be payable on breach with the loss that might be sustained if breach occurred. And I must say I agree with what Justice Coleman said. So what you're looking for is what is the predominant contractual function served by the clause in question. Is it to compensate for breach or is it really to deter the party, the other party from breach? Now in answering that question posed by Justice Coleman, the predominant purpose will be deterrent if on the above comparison the amount stipulated to be payable is either unconscionable unconscionable or out of all proportion to the damage likely to result from the breach, to use the terms favoured in the Australian cases, or oppressive to use a term that is used in the Canadian cases. In an English case, Alfred McAlpine Capital Projects and Tile Box, where the sum was held to be a genuine pre-estimate of damage, the level of the sum was the subject of debate in pre-contract negotiations and it was considered by the party's legal advisers. As it was a commercial contract between parties of equal bargaining power, Justice Jackson, uh, an English judge who is regarded as an authority in this field of the law and is now Lord Justice of, Justice of Appeal in England, indicated that the court should be extremely cautious before striking down a penalty clause in a commercial contract. He also found that the sum was at or slightly above the top of the range of possible losses flowing from the delay by the contractor, but the gap between that yardstick and the sum was not nearly wide enough to carry characterise the clause as a penalty. The case is an illustration of the kind of evidence which can support the liquidated damages character of a stipulated sum. A case which perhaps goes the other way is Tasmania and latent contractors, number three, which related to a clause which stipulated 
a rate of $8,000 per day as liquidated damages for delay in the completion of a highway. In holding that the provision was a penalty, Chief Justice Cox of Tasmania found that the amount of $8,000 per day was on the evidence of the principle extremely high, extravagant and speculative. The estimate was not based on a considered examination of the likely loss. The point of the evidence called in these cases was to show how the parties arrived at the payment stipulated as liquidated damages, that it was a genuine attempt to relate that payment to the damages that might arise on breach. But the fact that there was no agreement or even discussion between the parties as to what the loss might be is not in itself fatal to the validity of an agreed damages clause. It is, I think, true to say that the courts are today more inclined to uphold the validity of these clauses than the approach taken in the Dunlop case might seem to suggest. This is because the courts now recognise the importance of these provisions and because the courts attach more importance to the idea of freedom of contract, particularly in commercial cases, namely that the courts will respect the contract which the parties have made for themselves. The tendency is particularly noticeable in the English cases. In MacDonald and Costello, a very recent building case in England, uh, Lord Justice Etherton, speaking for the English Court of Appeal, said, the general rule should be to uphold contractual arrangements by which parties had defined and allocated and to that extent restricted their mutual obligations and in so doing had similarly allocated and circumscribed the consequences of non-performance. That general rule reflected a sound legal policy which acknowledged the party's autonomy to configure the legal relations between them and provided certainty and so limited disputes and litigation. If valid, the provision shortcut what otherwise would be a lengthy and expensive hearing on damages. The provisions therefore lessen the workload the courts would otherwise have to carry and lessen the time and cost of litigation, which in itself is a matter of increasing concern to the courts, governments and the community. In England, it has also been said that the dichotomy between a genuine pre-estimate of damages and a penalty does not cover all the possibilities. Lord Justice Mance, now Lord Mance, who is one of, English one of leading England's leading judges, pointed out that there are clauses which may operate in, on breach which fall into neither category and may be commercially justifiable. In another case, Azimut, Bennett and Healy, a contract for the construction of a luxury yacht provided for the payment of the purchase price by instalments over three years. The contract also provided that if payment was late, the builder could terminate the contract but recover or retain 20% of the total price. If the builder had received part of the price, he had to return it. The buyer defaulted in payment of an instalment. The judge, Justice Blair, gave short shrift to the argument that the 20% clause amounted to a penalty and gave judgment for the builder in the amount claimed. In doing so, he did not put much emphasis on the detailed evidence which he had received from both parties on whether or not 20% represented a genuine pre-estimate of the builder's loss. In this connection, he held that the clause was not a deterrent and was commercially justifiable as providing a balance between the parties upon lawful termination by the builder. Um, and he placed emphasis on this principle that the party's contract should be respected. In this instance, the judge clearly found that the dominant purpose of the clause was 
not primarily intended to deter breach, but instead to limit the delay which the builder would otherwise have to face in making a recovery based on the actual loss following the open market sale of the, be of the vessel. In reaching this conclusion, the judge considered, as he was entitled to, the parties' negotiations in agreeing to the liquidated damages provision which they had. Further, he approved of the approach taken in the McAlpine case, to which I referred earlier, where it was suggested that the court should be extremely cautious before striking down as penal a clause within a commercial contract. His approach does not provide a very clear test for determining whether the main or dominant purpose is deterrent. On his approach, one way of determining purpose is to ask the question, is the provision a fair estimate in all the circumstances? Australian courts have not yet followed this approach um, so far, and absent a decision of such an approach by the High Court of Australia, I think it is unlikely that they will and that they are much more likely to concentrate on the question, what is the predominant purpose, and to place emphasis on the means by which the agreed sum has been arrived at. Now, I should say something about the prevention doctrine. The doctrine of prevention may prevent a party from recovering liquidated damages. The doctrine is that the party may require the other to comply with an obligation in circumstances where that party has itself prevented compliance. So a principal may lose his right to recover liquidated damages if the principal has caused or contributed to the contractor's delay. In Peak Constructions Liverpool and McKinney Foundation, an English case, the principal lost his right to recover even for other delays attributable to the liquidated, attributable to um, the contractor. But in Rapid Building and Ealing Family Housing Association, Lloyd Justice Lloyd, Lord Justice Lloyd avoided this result by allowing the principal to recover in respect of the delays caused by the contractor. This result is consistent with the approach in another case in the House of Lords where it was held that the whole period of delay damages is not necessarily lost. Thus the ordering of variations after the date of practical completion did not prevent recovery, recovery at least for the period between the date for practical completion and the ordering of the variations. Acts of prevention by the principal will set time at large and render inoperative an agreed damages clause in the absence of an applicable extension of time clause. The purpose of such a clause is to enable the principal to recover under the clause where an extension of time is granted in consequence of requested variations. Variations, even if authorised under the contract, will be regarded as acts of prevention. In an Australian case, a contractor agreed to install cupboards in a dwelling house before 15th July 1980 with an extension of time for weather for $2,000. The clause provided for liquidated damages of $35 per day from the 22nd of July. The full court decided, full court of Victoria, decided that in the absence of an appropriate extension of damages, extension time clause, or unless the contractor undertakes to complete, notwithstanding extras and variations, liquidated damages cannot be recovered if completion has been delayed by extras or variations. The court also held that extras or variations ordered after the due completion date, which delay completion, bring the right to recover to an end 
but they do not affect liquidated damages previously accrued. Um, and you can contrast another case where there was an express power to extend time for the act of prevention which had occurred, the ordering of the variations after the completion date. There was delay by the contractor and variations ordered by the principal while the contractor was in delay. Justice Coleman held in that case that the contractor was entitled to two months extension, the date from the time fixed for completion, not from the date when the variations were ordered. Um, there are a number of cases along those lines, and in one of them, uh, a local judge, Justice Cole, in New South Wales, said, if the builder, having the right to claim an extension of time, failed to do so, it cannot claim that the act of prevention, which would have entitled it to an extension of time for practical completion, resulted in its ability to complete by that time. A party cannot rely on preventing conduct where it failed to exercise a contractual right which would have negated the effect of that preventing conduct. The contractor's right to an extension of time depends primarily on the relevant provision in the contract. The relevant provision may give rise to an extension of time in situations normally at the contractor's risk. For example, strikes, force majeure, or a shortage of labour and materials. Liquidated damages may be lost when a superintendent fails to grant an extension of time within a stipulated or reasonable time. An exercise of the power to extend time outside the period may result in the principal's loss of the right to recover liquidated damages. Standard forms of contract have been drafted with a view to overcoming this difficulty by giving the superintendent power to grant an extension of time outside stipulated periods. Where there are two concurrent causes of delay, one entitling an extension of time, the other not contractor delay, the position is not entirely clear. A question of fact arises. Um, an English judge, Justice Dyson, now Lord Dyson, seems to have thought that the architect could grant an extension of time for the time if he thought it fair and reasonable to do so. But another judge seems to have been of the view that if the contractor's delay was not concurrent, but first in time, an extension of time should not be granted. The true answer to this problem may be to ascertain the real or dominant cause of the delay so that the contractor should only obtain an extension of time if he is not the real or dominant cause of the delay. In some cases, it may be sensible to extend time by reference to the proportionate responsibility of the parties for the delay. A particular problem arises when the word nil is inserted in the space allocated to the specific fixation of the amount of or the formula for liquidated damages. In one case it was held that this evinced an, an intention that neither liquidated nor unliquidated damages could be recovered. This seems to me to be an extremely doubtful outcome. And in another case the result was otherwise. It all depends upon the intention of the parties to be deduced as a matter of interpretation of the documents forming the contract. Unless the contract amounts to an exhaustive agreement or a limitation as to the relevant damages, that is for a delay, it is unlikely that it will be regarded as excluding unliquidated damages. The outcome in a particular case may be problematic. Obviously care should be taken in the preparation of the contract to avoid a pitfall of this kind. There are cases in which the liquidated damages agreed upon are very small and the principal's loss in consequence of the contractor's breach is very great. The question in these cases is can the principal elect as between liquidated damages and liquidated damages, that is the right to sue for damages. The English case, cases reject the argument that the principal has an option and hold that it is restricted to the agreed damages clause. 
In such a case, although the liquidated damages not, may not be a genuine pre-estimate of loss, the English courts have not regarded it as a penalty. The point is that the par parties have excluded unliquidated damages by their contract. In one of these cases, the liquidated damages were fixed at £20 per week in the event that the contractor did not build by the completion date uh, an acetone recovery plant as part of a larger plan for the manufacture of artificial silk. The completion was 30 weeks later. The principal sued to recover its actual loss, £5,850. The House of Lords held that only £600, the liquidated damages amount, was recoverable. Um, For my part, I am inclined to think that the reliance on the principle that clear words are necessary in order to bring about the exclusion of a common law remedy might achieve a different result. In uh, Concut and Worrell, the High Court of Australia referred to the familiar principle of construction that clear words are needed to rebut the presumption that a contracting party does not intend to abandon any remedies for breach of the contract arising by operation of law. But at the end of the day, the question is one of interpretation, and that turns on the words of the particular contract, and uh, interpreting the words of the contract means that you have to look at the contract as a whole. Um, it's well established that this liquidated damages penalty distinction applies only to damages for breach of contract. The distinction has no application to payments contracted to be made otherwise than by way of damages for breach of contract, no matter how extravagant they may be. Outside the area of such damages for breach, freedom of contract prevails, and the parties can agree as they like. Um, but what if the parties stipulate for payment of an amount on the occurrence of an event which is related to a breach of contract? For example, termination on a party's reasonable belief that the other party engaged in fraudulent or deceptive activity under the contract. Such a question recently arose in a local case, Interstar Wholesale Finance and Integral Home Loans. At first instance, the judge preferring substance over form and thinking that there was an implied obli obligation under the contract, not to engage in fraudulent or deceptive conduct, held that the amount stipulated was a penalty. The New South Wales Court of Appeal held that the doctrine of penalties had no application because the payment was not triggered by a breach of contract. They disagreed with the trial judge's interpretation of the contract. Now, the High Court of Australia granted special leave to appeal, but the parties denied the world the benefit of the High Court decision by settling the case. That's always a disaster for the lawyers when a case is settled like that. Um, now, there are some unresolved difficulties which I won't trouble you with as the night wears on, but in conclusion, uh, I'll make these observations. If you're called upon to draft a liquidated damages clause, you should keep the following matters clearly in mind. Ensure that the clause is not void for uncertainty. Avoid stipulating a lump sum payment because it will apply to both major and trifling breaches of contract. Ensure that the time, ensure that you fix the time for practical completion or completion as the case may be. Avoid putting words like nil or not applicable in the annexure which is designed to specify the liquidated damages that are payable and ensure that the standard forms of clause are appropriate to your own situation. By and large, the biggest mistake that people making drafting contracts make is to use a standard form without sufficiently analysing the provisions in that form to see whether those provisions are suitable to the contract that you're going to make. 
and above all else, avoid making that mistake. And on that note, I'll conclude.